Now you've heard the phrase, too much of a good thing can be a bad thing, but I pose the question, does that apply to books as well? Mentioned in this article by LitHub called There Are Too Many Books Being Published, uh, it was noted that Penguin Random House's new CEO told the New York Times that he envisioned a new strategy for increasing market share, which is using AI, artificial intelligence, to publish more books. Now this is, this statement alone is enough to open an entire can of worms and get a lot of different people talking, whether you are privy to the business or whether you're just commenting as an outsider. Let's say that we use AI to publish more books. Does that necessarily mean that more is better if you get to crank out more books with hiring less staff? I mean, in terms of business, yeah, it makes sense. I mean, you're able to produce a lot more stuff with a lot less overhead, you know, a lot more costs, but is that necessarily beneficial for all the people who are consuming those books? How will it affect your reputation as a very, very large publisher if you're churning out books that maybe are a little bit lesser in quality because they were written by AI. Now, I'm someone personally who believes that AI is not a substitute for organic human creativity. I think it's a great supplement, but I just personally don't think it's it's the substitute for, you know, other authors or writers or things. So that's just my own little opinion. If this is the case, is more better? How does it contribute to overconsumption of books and other products? You throw a bunch of products against the wall, see what sticks, and write off the ones, a vast majority that don't work. It definitely feels this way. It just feels a little bit harder to find people out there in the world making stuff with passion and with curiosity and with genuine interest for what they're doing and the kind of quality that they're providing for people, the value that they're providing for their consumers. It just seems like we're living in a particular age right now where we're constantly being pitched to. There's there's constantly sponsorships. There's constantly product launches. There's always something to get your hands on, the newest iPhone, the best skincare line, Lady Gaga's lipstick, I don't know. And it just makes the books that really, really are good and truly high quality reads, it just sort of buries them a little bit. And then the people, you know, the diehard readers who do find these books might, might feel like it's kind of hard to rise above the noise and be like, no, like for real, this book is the, the shiz. It is like golden. Don't worry about that. Like this book is definitely worth your time, which I do feel like Book Talk has done a really good job of introducing. But, you know, I would say that the only difference between true word of mouth and a platform like TikTok is that there's an algorithm involved. And if they see that one particular title is doing better than the other, then everyone and their mother's gonna wanna go buy it. And then it kind of starts the whole cycle over again, I feel like, you know, of, okay, like I've already read this book, it was fine, it was whatever, like what, what other great book recommendations do you have? And then you have to rise above the noise again, become a trend. Personally, that's just me personally. You are free to disagree, but just as I'm rambling on, I just, that was one of my thoughts that I had to share. Now with the rise of self-publishing, it makes it a lot easier for people to get past the gatekeeping and share their story and get their book published and out into the world. Hey, it's a less barrier of entry. You too can write a book and share your story. You know, the only catch is that you're gonna be responsible for everything or held accountable for everything unless you wanna hire out external support to help you self-publish. But does that contribute to overconsumption of books as well? The reason that that self-publishing, in my opinion, just based on what I've seen and what I've, what I've absorbed and what I've seen other people say, is that a lot of people turn to self-publishing because they like the control. They like having the ball in their court. They like having a faster timeline. They like pocketing majority of the royalties. A lot of people turn to self-publishing because maybe they don't feel supported by past publishers maybe that they've worked with. And this is something that I've seen and heard a lot. Many authors who work with these large publishers or just traditional publishers in general are often unsatisfied with the level of support that they get. I'm not commenting on anyone in particular. I'm genuinely not. I'm just making a broad statement based on what I've seen and what I've heard. After a book is acquired by a publisher, typically the author would sign over their rights to that book basically giving their book legally to their publisher and in exchange they'll get like a small little chunk of the royalties. And based on what this article has to say, they mentioned that many authors feel like they are kind of left out or maybe not given as much attention after they sign over the rights because they're maybe in competition with a lot of these other bigger clients that these large publishers are working with like celebrities or influencers or very impactful and influencer industry leaders. I would not be surprised if a major publisher kind of put me on the back burner to work on Britney Spears. Frankly, I wouldn't blame them. <laughs> so maybe some of these authors who've gotten these large advances feel like they're prioritized over others who maybe didn't get such a large book deal. And another little point that this article mentioned too was that too many other titles in the same season crash because they're 
trendy. A lot of very similar types of books kind of all happen or I feel like pu get published at the same time. Just as a consumer, commenting as a consumer, it just feels this way. Like it was the Hunger Games and like Divergent and all these like dystopian sort of stories. Now it's very, very heavily romantic where you have Sarah J Moss and you have um, Jennifer Armentrout, for example, like very, like very much, there are definitely trends with the types of books that sell and the particular time periods that they sell. So it makes sense for a very large business or entity to want to kind of capitalize on that sort of thing. But because it's it's like a sugar crash, you know, like it, it there's a big burst and then it'll kind of drop off and then we'll be on to the next thing. So I have heard that a lot of imprints open and close because, because there are so many of these trend-based books. I'm not saying that's a good thing. I'm not saying that's a bad thing to have trend-based books, but it is an observation and it is something that happens. Now, an interesting question that this particular author posed in this article based on all that being said, was what do corporate publishing and streaming have in common? They're very often run by people who don't engage with the products they put out. And it is not the first time that I've heard this. I think I mentioned there was another, I think it was like the president of Pen America or something or some other industry person who said something very similar. I'm going to see if I can plug in one of my previous videos that mentions that here, just because I, I think it's worth sharing. Ayad Akhtar, who is a Pulitzer Prize winning playwright and president of Pen America, puts it really well, and I think I want to kick off with a quote from him. He says, writers are figuring out how to fit into a system where executives who are ultimately non-creative are making determinations about what's going to work on a platform. And I think that's a very astute observation. So an example of this is probably the writer's strike that we had this past year. At streaming companies, creative executives were very quickly being replaced by tech executives who drove the industry toward making production decisions based on data sets about the kinds of stories that held audiences' attention, right? It just seems like it's been boiled down to a bottom line, to a formula, to an algorithm in recent years, whether it be through TV and movie, whether it be through books, I just feel like there's been a lot of mergers and buyouts lately that that's something that th there's gonna be like a changing of the guards in both of those industries. She also said, this leaves consumers with formulaic unvetted choices through useless algorithms and very little human intervention. And because so much stuff is constantly being marketed or people are constantly trying to rise above the noise, I feel like we now live in a problem of overconsumption where we turn to books that are maybe overhyped, but under delivered in terms of value or in terms of, you know, quality or something. And this, I feel like puts consumers, especially very, very bookish consumers in a really, really hard spot because they want to like these books. They want to give them the benefit of the doubt. But in the end, they might think that they're just not that good because maybe there's so many others just like them where it's like there's, I hate to say it, but there's less of that vetting. So you don't know which books truly are worth your attention because I feel like a person's attention or their time are two of the biggest currencies that a person can spend. And if they read it or they give it a shot and they don't like it, it's just for whatever reason, us bookish people just feel really, really bad throwing a book away. Oh my gosh. It's like, that's like the ultimate sin to throw a book away. But it's, it's, you just feel so bad saying that you didn't like it, that you didn't like what this well-known or very unknown author wrote about. You just, you have this guilt and you feel obligated to keep it because it was so hyped up or because someone recommended it to you or you thought it looked good. And it's just, now you have a whole stack of books like me with my very large over filled bookshelf in the other room where you don't really know what to do with it because you don't really want to read it, but you don't really want to give it away. And you're just kind of stuck in this really rough spot. And the author of this other article that I'm popping up here uh, also included a really interesting quote where they said, if we hate some artwork, hate some of the food from fancy restaurants that are supposed to be great and hate the design fabric and everything related to some of the furniture we feel shouldn't have been created, then why can't we hate books? And I think for whatever reason, it just feels very hard to give up something as pure and precious as a book. But I kind of, I kind of agree a little bit of if you don't like a book, don't feel obligated to keep it. I think that's a, I think that's a very okay boundary to have with a lot of things in your life, books included. And as a result, I have to say there are moments and periods in time where I feel like I just don't like reading. And I feel like right now is sort of one of those times for me, if I'm being genuinely honest. I go through periods where I don't read at all. I go through periods where I find a lot of really great books and I read them all. I don't think it's realistic to constantly keep up with every single book, read it, and like it personally. I'm a very, very picky person to begin with. There's, I don't swap out very many of these books on my back shelf just because 
these these books are like the bar for me. Like there has to be a book that matches it or goes above it to make it on this shelf. So I'm very, very picky with books to begin with, especially fiction. And I've read 10 books this year so far, and I have yet to be obsessed with one of them, if I'm being honest. Although I am a nonfiction girl, so I tend to read nonfiction books for like solutions or answers. But even like with fiction, with some fiction, like it's for me, it's just so hard to like find the one that I truly click with that I feel like that I feel like meets me where I'm at. I just apart from maybe A Court of Thorns and Roses, I got on that trend. And the first couple books actually were pretty good. But apart from that, I can't remember the last time I was genuinely obsessed with a book recently. And I really, really, really like what Jane Friedman said in her Substack. I feel I feel like her Substack is a little bit lesser known than maybe her website or her blogs, if you're familiar with her. Um, if you're not, she is a veteran of the publishing industry. She's been in it for like the past 20 or 30 years. So she has a lot of amazing resources for um, aspiring writers. But this particular uh, substack of hers, I just found it really, really refreshing because if you know Jane Friedman, you know that she is heavily, heavily, heavily associated with books and with publishing. It's just a massive part of her brand. She says, I don't care about books for their own sake. I think the vast majority of books shouldn't be published in the first place. I scoff at arguments that books foster great empathy. Even if true, it's a tiny number of books and many other things foster empathy just as well. Books are not that special or wholesome. People today use books as therapy, self-care, identity tools, status symbols, fame vehicles, authority markers, all sorts of reasons that make me want to distance myself from the whole operation of book publishing. So it definitely kind of feels like books are very, very heavily in the business. Like it feels like the pendulum in the book sphere on, and the book spectrum is very, very heavily swung towards business where people want lots of money. People like predictable algorithms of like, this book did well, we took a chance on that one. So let's just maximize these efforts as much as, much as possible. Let's talk about influencer shout outs. Let's talk about these influencer campaigns. Let's talk about sending non-bookish people on cruises to promote our books, which is a very real thing that happened within the past year. It's almost like doing everything but producing a good book, which I feel like personally, if you're going to put out the effort and the energy to make a book at all, might as well really dedicate yourself to it. Put the time aside to really make sure that you're doing it right, that people like it, and that, you know, you are also simultaneously defining what your definition of success is separate from what the industry or the business says that it should be. Another thing that Jane mentioned too is that because of the line of work that she's in, she's given books all the time, whether it's through events, whether it's through colleagues or friends, or I don't know, maybe even recommendations or something. It just feels like you are always, always, always acquiring more books that you know you're not gonna read, which sounds really bad, but it's like, it's like the, that, <laughs> For for whatever reason, the scene from The Grinch comes to mind where like there's five different people standing around him like shoving food in his mouth, telling him to try it and see what, what see what he thinks. I hope you I hope you remember what I'm talking about. <laughs> Otherwise I'm gonna sound like an idiot. It sort of reminds me of that if everyone is like, tell me what you think, tell me what you think. I want I want this thing to be the next big thing. I want to be this next big author. And it's like it's almost like an everybody's own winner type of mentality, which again I I know is another type of subject or topic that could get a lot of people heated, a lot of people very opinionated, but it does sort of feel like this. It's like in Bruce Almighty when everyone wins a lottery ticket in the Buffalo, New York area. It's like The Incredibles where that syndrome guy said, if everyone's super, no one will be, which I didn't really understand until like 10 years after I watched that movie as a kid. <laughs> and I personally do believe there will come a day when anonymity will be an extremely highly desired trait because everybody wants to be in the limelight. Everyone wants to be the next big bookish celebrity, you know, or influencer or whatever. But I just feel like there's gonna be a day where the pendulum swings the other way. And it's just like, there can never just be a happy medium, can there? It's always gotta be one side or the other, just generally across the board in life in different areas, I feel like. So final thoughts. So my SD card didn't save any of my, th my, any of my final thoughts. And then my computer kept glitching whenever I recorded it on my webcam. So here we are, apologies for the mix up. But in terms of final thoughts, I think that people appreciate and respond really well to authentic humanness, not AI, not like, you know, corporate-y looking commercials, not formulaic books that are planned to be trendy. I think it's just, I think the stuff people like the most is the same stuff that's really hard to control, which is word of mouth, making a really good book at the right time. I just think that there's a lot that's outside of people's control and it's very attractive if, if someone can bottle success 
or the next big book into some kind of formula that, you know, maybe allows other people to also share some of the spotlight. So again, kind of that everybody's a winner type of mentality. I think there are times and places for that kind of thing. But personally, my own opinion, I think that with books, a little bit of vetting, I don't think is necessarily a bad thing. The other thing too that kind of goes along with that is that not everyone's book needs to see commercial success in the same way that not everyone needs to be a celebrity. It's okay to write a book for yourself. It's okay to write a book for your family and friends. It's okay to write a book to, to check off a bucket list item. I don't think it needs to be so all or nothing. I personally value qua uh, what is it? quality over quantity. It takes me a minute to think about which is which quality over quantity. And if that means that I go three years and only find one really good book, as long as it changes my life, I'm a happy person. And finally, I think it's okay for people to set boundaries with books. I think it's very okay to not be interested in any books at the moment. Like me, I wish I was obsessed with a book, but I'm not right now. I think that it's okay to say that you don't like a book. I think it's okay to give some of them away if you have too many that you know that you're not going to read because it's very easy, especially in the content age and the content creation age, to buy things for the entertainment or to buy things to become the next bestseller. A lot of best-selling book campaigns happen that way. People will buy 10,000 copies of their own book in order to make it onto some kind of prestigious list. That's kind of the point that I'm making, I guess, when I'm talking about there being too many books. I think in this case, curation isn't such a bad thing. I don't think vetting is such a bad thing. I think buying the books that you know you're gonna read, even if it's one that isn't popular, isn't trendy, is a very okay thing to do. So these are just my two cents. I'm very curious to hear what you have to say. If you have any thoughts, feel free to share them below. And if you got something out of this video, please consider liking and subscribing. It helps other people discover the channel as well. So I think that's all I got and I'll see you in the next video. Take care until then, see you later.